Welcome back to Joe's Productions. Today we're taking a look at the 1980s, the rise of Ronald Reagan, and a whole bunch of other stuff. We're almost done. We're almost ready to, for the AP exam in May, so hopefully you're feeling confident. So you can't understand the rise of Reagan without understanding the rise of the conservative movement. And you can trace this all the way back to the election of 1964. Remember, Barry Goldwater is running as the Republican candidate against Lyndon Johnson. Although he loses, the conservative movement movement is really starting to become a national movement with some influence. Nixon gets elected in 1968 as the Republican Party candidate and starts adopting more Republican policies at the federal level. And the conservative movement is really a reaction to a whole bunch of things that had been happening, especially in the 60s. You see this reaction to New Deal liberalism. You know, remember Franklin Roosevelt establishing the welfare state in America. You have other presidents like Harry Truman with his fair deal. And then the big one is Lyndon Johnson and the Great Society. Many Republicans and conservatives don't like a large federal government. They don't like this welfare state. There's a reaction to feminism, all the changing roles for women in society, the legalization of abortion with Roe versus Wade, the sexual revolution of the 1960s, the expansion of gay rights, and affirmative action policies where race and gender are playing a role in job selection or college admission, drug use, especially of the counterculture, and there's a belief that these issues undermined family and religious values, traditional values as they're oftentimes referred to, a work ethic, right? If we give too many government programs, people are going to become lazy or dependent. And because of the Cold War going on, this idea it's undermining national security. And what you see, even before Reagan gets elected in 1980, is the rise of various movements. You have the Moral Majority Movement founded by Reverend Jerry Falwell. These are religious fundamentalists and they become very involved in electoral politics, mobilizing and supporting traditional conservative candidates. These individuals want creationism taught in schools. They want a reversal of Roe versus Wade, the so-called Right to Life Movement, and a host of other conservative issues. You also um, can see these individuals are called the rise of the religious right. Um, and there's all sorts of different groups, not just the moral majority, but others like Focus on the Family, who advocate for abstinence, education, pro-life policies. So the conservative movement is mobilizing throughout the late 60s, 70s, and in 1980, they get their guy, Ronald Reagan, gets elected. You know, the election of Ronald Reagan in 1980 was an important milestone for the conservative movement. He beats Jimmy Carter. Jimmy Carter is running for re-election. He gets slaughtered. And Reagan had been around for a while. He was involved in 1964 politics with Barry Goldwater, kind of trying to get him elected. He becomes governor of California, former actor. He's the man in 1980, and he takes office in 1981. This is the new right. They're opposed to government, uh, large federal governments, deficits. The famous quote, government is not the solution to our problem. Government is the problem. So this is a very different view of the role of government from Republicans with the election of Reagan. They're against liberal programs. Very often, they ha opposed government entitlement spending. So spending on programs like food stamps, welfare, which had exploded between 1960 and 1980, especially with the Great Society, they want cuts in those programs. They felt they were counterproductive in fighting poverty, they created dependency, and they didn't actually stimulate economic growth. This was the argument from conservative Republicans, the new right. Important to keep in mind, even though there are cuts to programs like food stamps and welfare under Reagan, there are many programs remain popular with voters. So especially Social Security from the New Deal days and Medicare under the Great Society. Those programs, which at one time were controversial for some Republicans or some small government advocates, they remain popular and are going to sustain during Reagan's presidency as well. Now, important you know about Reagan and the economy, there's going to be some things he's going to do. He favored what was known as supply-side economics, or Reaganomics as it was called. And the basic idea is 
there was enacted significant tax cuts for the rich. And the idea would B is that the private sector, rich, wealthy individuals would invest money and spend money to improve the economy. And this idea of trickle down economics. If I'm a business or if I'm a wealthy individual and if the government taxes me less, I'm going to then hire more workers and grow my business. And this is very similar to the policies of the Republican administrations of the 1920s, especially under Calvin Coolidge, Warren G. Harding, and Herbert Hoover. This idea of trickle down economics. Other, under Reagan, you also see support for deregulation of many industries. Remember, they argue for smaller government. And this really deregulation started in the 1970s. There was a growing group, especially Republicans, who supported free market approach. Let the market determine what's going to happen. And restrictions on banks uh, were lessened. Auto emissions uh, regulations were reduced environmental protections were eased, and so on during the 1980s under Reagan. Union membership continued to decline, especially in the 1980s. Remember, there's a lot of different reasons for this. Many of the manufacturing jobs were going overseas, so therefore they're very difficult to unionize those workers. And there were anti-union policies, uh, or at least no pro-union policies under the Reagan administration. In fact, federal air traffic controllers were fired for going on strike, and labor unions continued to become weaker and weaker throughout the 1980s. You are not going to see the federal budget balanced under Reagan. The federal budget was not balanced, and there's a variety of reasons for this. Two of them are increased defense spending. He's spending lots of money on the defense industry, and the fact that there are tax cuts, especially for the wealthy, this is going to mean the budget is going to continue to go up. So in spite of his wanting less federal government, the federal budget deficit will increase under Reagan. So you're spending more money on defense while at the same time taking in less tax revenues, the budget is going to increase. Now Reagan's foreign policy is key as well. He is going to advocate and pursue a interventionist foreign policy. He's going to be very heavily involved in the world. And of course, Reagan asserted U.S. opposition to communism through a variety of different methods. The Cold War had kind of cooled a bit under Carter and Ford. There were issues and under Nixon with detente. Reagan's going to pursue speeches, his so-called, his famous evil empire speech, where he calls the Soviet Union an evil empire. He is going to have limited military interventions in places like Grenada. We'll talk about that in a moment. And he's going to have diplomatic efforts, um, and his relationship with Mikhail Gorbachev is hugely important, and it is going to lead to a relaxation of tension. There you can see Reagan and Gorby right there. Military spending is going to increase, as we've mentioned, and all of these things are going to be used by the Reagan administration to limit um, communist expansion. He's also going to propose a strategic defense initiative, SDI. The nickname was Star Wars, where basically the idea would be lasers from space stations would be used to defend against potential uh, attacks, especially nukes. Um, the lasers would shoot out the nukes from the sky. It is very costly. A lot of people criticized it, and it actually never happened as a result. But these are all different strategies that Reagan utilized in his opposition to communism. Now, important to keep in mind is this idea of the Reagan doctrine. And basically, Reagan says in his doctrine, he and the U.S. are going to support opponents of communism anywhere and everywhere. And he didn't necessarily make a connection to Soviet-supported communism. We are just going to be opposed to communism wherever it happens to be. Um, and an example of this commitment to an anti-communist cause can be seen in 1979 in Nicaragua, a Marxist group known as the Sandinistas led a revolt against the pro-American right-wing dictatorship. So there was a government, they were very right-wing, they were not democratic, and a Marxist group, the Sandinistas, revolt against them and overthrow them. This is going to lead Reagan and his administration to increase U.S. involvement in the so-called third world and pursue a very interventionist foreign policy. We are going to support the right-wing dictator since they are, in fact, anti-communist. 
what you're going to see is the Reagan administration provided military aid to the Contras. The Contras were an anti-government guerrilla group. They are opposed to this Marxist group, and the U U.S. is going to give them funding in their fight against the Sandinistas, the Sandinistas being the Marxist group. And this becomes very controversial because Congress, controlled by Democrats in 1985, passed something called the Bolin Amendment, which prevented further aid to the Contras. We were worried that we were very much getting involved in the internal affairs of this country in Central America, and Congress says no more to this. Another example of Reagan's foreign policy can be seen in, seen in Grenada. There's a pro-Cuban regime which comes to power after a coup. You can see Grenada on the map. And Reagan sends in, in 1983, a small force of Marines to return the pro-U.S. government to power. So once again, very active around the world trying to pursue U.S. interests even if those conflicted with the local population. A very famous event you should know about is the Iran-Contra affair, where weapon sales to Iran were used to fund Contras in Nicaragua. Remember, the Contras were those fighting the Sandinistas. This becomes hugely controversial for a couple of reasons. One, it was illegal since it violated the Bolin Amendment. We were not supposed to give funds to the Contras. Um, and it very much embarrassed the Reagan administration because he said publicly he was not going to negotiate with terrorists and one of the reasons we were selling these weapons is to Iran was because they were going to help us get some American hostages free. Uh, Reagan claimed he didn't have anything to do with it, so the administration suffers a blow in its popularity. The U.S. and the Soviet Union are going to be a key part of this story as well. Cold War tensions increased under Reagan with all these different U.S. interventions, but it's important to note also that his relationship with Gorbachev, and who comes to power in 1985, is going to be hugely important. Um, Gorbachev comes to power in 1985 and begins a series of reforms. The economy of the Soviet Union was in awful shape. The arms race was costing them so much money and their economy had just kind of declined. And he starts a series of reforms. One is known as glasnost or openness, greater political freedom. And the other one is perestroika. This is slowly implemented capitalist reforms, letting free market ideas and practices into Soviet society. These reforms dramatically transform the Soviet Union. And then partly as a result, you're going to see huge changes in the Cold War. Gorbachev is going to pull back in places such as Eastern Europe. He basically says we're no longer going to support these countries. And in places like Poland, you're going to see independence movements and eventually the formation of non-communist countries in that, once place, in that place once called the Iron Curtain. Um, you're also going to see famous kind of moments during the Cold War, Reagan in 1987 speaking in Germany, saying Mr. Gorbachev tear down this wall at Brandenburg Gate right there in front of the Berlin Wall. And so all of these things are changing very rapidly. You're going to have arms control agreements as well. And the most famous one is in 1987, Gorbachev and Reagan signed the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty, the INF Treaty, which eliminates those weapons from both the U.S. and the Soviet arsenals. And not too long after Reagan leaves office, the Cold War will finally come to an end. It had been going through periods of intense conflict to periods of relaxation of tensions, and you're going to see the Cold War end it due to a variety of factors. There are political and economic changes in the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe. Here you see people kind of climbing atop the Berlin Wall, the reforms in the Soviet Union, coupled with the huge problems the Soviet economy was having, all of this kind of begins uh, to finalize this process that had been going on for a while. Increased U.S. military spending kind of made the Soviets unable to compete, which contributes to the downfall of the Soviet Union. You have Reagan's diplomatic initiatives where the U.S. and the Soviets are negotiating, especially that relationship between Gorbachev and Reagan. And by 1991, you are going to have the dissolution of the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union will cease to exist. You're going to have coups in various former Soviet republics declaring independence, and the Soviet Union will come to an end, and this will be under George Bush. 
At the end of the Cold War, this required the U.S. to redefine its role in the world. This is really important, but later on, and the big thing is going to be following attacks on 9-11, the focus became fighting terrorism. So no longer was the enemy a very clear target, the Soviet Union. It's going to be much more difficult in this post-Cold War world because the enemy is not one nation. It is this terrorist threat. Couple things about George Bush you should know just really quickly. He is elected in 1988. And kind of one of the big events you should know is the Persian Gulf War, or what was known as Operation Desert Storm. In 1990, Iraq, under the leadership of Saddam Hussein, they invaded neighboring Kuwait. Kuwait was a very oil-rich country. Saddam Hussein invades it, and the United States enters. Uh, on behalf of Kuwait into a fight, a U.S.-led coalition, and they ultimately removed Iraqi troops and liberated Kuwait. This was a joint effort with other countries, with the U.S. playing a huge role in the war. One last thing about Reagan and Bush presidencies, you're going to get the rise of a conservative Supreme Court. Remember, this is in sharp contrast with the decisions of the Warren Court, which was around from 1953 to 1969, led by Earl Warren. You're going to get more conservative justices. Famously, Sandra Day O'Connor is nominated to the Supreme Court in 1981. She is the first woman, and she is nominated by Ronald Reagan. You're going to get other conservative justices like Antonin Scalia, who just passed away in 2016. Clarence Thomas is nominated by George Bush. There's a huge battle over his uh, confirmation because of sexual harassment charges. And the court, under these more conservative judges, are going to do things like allow states to place restrictions on abortion so parents had to be notified in one of the cases the court rules and affirmative action policies were rolled back so they rule in a much more conservative way than previous courts had that's going to do it for today you are almost to the finish line make sure before you take the ap exam you eat a good meal i love street tacos but it's probably not the best bet just before you're going to sit for an over three hour test Good luck in May. Have a beautiful day. Make sure you subscribe and peace.